Hello there, and welcome back to my YouTube channel, James here as ever for today's ACCA Management Accounting F2 video, all about helping you how to pass your exam, going through some extra MTQ questions directly from ACCA's website. If this is the first time you've ever clicked on one of my videos, hello, hello, my name's James, I'm an ACCA qualified tutor from the UK and ACCA qualified member, and on my channel I help our ACCA students pass their examination. So if that is something you'd be interested in, be sure to subscribe and hit the button below because all of my videos are dedicated to my lovely subscribers and today is no different. So as you can see in the middle of the screen now, Sana, thank you so much for your comment. I'm more than happy to do for you a lovely little walk and talk through in today's video, going through some ratio analysis and some performance management that you need to know for your management accounting ACCA exam. Also, if you've got any questions, feel free to leave me a comment below. Let me know what you thought of the video. And of course, be sure to give it a massive like and thumbs up so that more ACCA students can see these videos. And honestly, I really appreciate all the support for the channel. It's so pleasing that the videos are helping so many students around the world pass their exams. Now to actually uh, come on to the question for Donnie Co, which you'll be going through today. If you want access to have a go at it yourself, just click the link below. As you can see on the screen now, it will take you through to the CBE specimen exam and MTQs. Then simply click away. And this is a 10 mark question. So in the real exam, you'll have 12 minutes to complete it. Now, why, why is that? Well, in the exam, you have two hours and 100 marks. So that's 1.2 minutes per mark. So hence only 12 minutes to go through this and there's going to be some calculations. We've got to think it through. So the video is designed to walk and talk you through all the key aspects. So make sure you stay to the end, grab yourself a pen and paper, and this could be the difference in getting you across the line to pass your examination. So if it was me in the real exam, um, I'd also have my calculator, but for the purposes of the video, and we'll be using the computer what on here and as ever running on a zero budget for the channel as well. So if it's a normal exam question like you can see on here, what would I be doing? Well, before I'd even go into anything on the background or anything like that, you've got to first of all identify what sort of boxes have we got, any pull downs. I'm asking, I'm saying to myself in the exam, right, we've got percentages, number of times, dollars. Um, we've also got to the nearest whole number. We've got an input charge on there, uh, some yes or no's that we're going to have to go through. And also another key thing to get down is notice the capital letters. This is the examiner wanting you to pay attention because so many students, they talk about it in the examiner's report, like in task around here, where they ask for two options that you need to put down. Some students only put one, some put none. But if you only put one, you can't get any marks for it on there. So we've got bits on non-financial indicators, performance management, as I said at the start of the video, and some ratio analysis about this south division, whatever that is. So 10 marks, let's start to go through it, as if I was if I was you, for obviously for a bit of fun, for some management accounting today. Um, but the, 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 the background you can see for the director of Donnyco is reviewing the performance of one of its divisions. So it's only one of them out of a, a group on there. The following information is available for the year ended 31st of March 2009 for its South Division. So no doubt there'll probably be a North, East and West Division as well. But for the South Division, let's pick up on the units on here because that's going to be key. So $50,000 sales, operating profit. So all about the, uh, the income statement here, statement of profit and loss. And we've also got capital employed, which refers to how much has actually been uh, finance to to get this South Division up and running. So we're not told if it's balanced out of debt and equity, uh, but that is what it relates to. The South Division operates in the food retail industry and the total food retail industry sales for the same year ending 31st of March 2009 were $1.25 million. So I'm automatically thinking there, the industry sales is $1.25 million for that same period and we have in the actual um, South Division have $50,000 worth of the industry total. So just something to bear in mind as we go through. So coming on to uh, task one, and what I'll do is I'll keep the figures on the screen because then that will help us out as we go through. 
And again, feel free to have a go at this uh, by yourself, see how you get on. Uh, I'm going to use my um, expensive calculator on the side here to go through it myself. But these are the key marks you've got to be picking up on that will be the difference in you passing. And one of the things that the examiner puts in their uh, report is students make silly mistakes. So notice in the video how I'm just going to walk and talk it through to you to make it as easy as possible. But first of all, when you see calculate the following performance measures, the ratio analysis, just read it through nice and easy and also pay particular attention to these brackets because we've been asked to put to the nearest whole number, to one decimal place, a charge on there, whole number again, whole number. So don't fall into the trap which so many students do. Now, coming on to the return on investment. So if you're in the exam and you get ratios and your mind goes blank on this, okay, it goes completely blank and you go, oh my gosh, James, return on investment. What could that mean? So just think to yourself, if it was your business or you're working as a management accounting in a multinational company, and I said to you, calculate for me the return on investment, well, you'd be thinking, right, the return is going to be linking to the profit at the end of the day, what we've made. And then the, uh, the actual investment is how much money have we put into this business? Well, from what we just walked and talked through, and you can see the figures on the screen, the profit that we had and we were given on here was $700. And I'm going to divide that now by the 3500 for the capital employed that was the investment needed to get the project up and running. So we get 0.2. Now, key thing for your notes here, as we're asked to the nearest whole number, so with any actual ratios, we multiply it by 100, and that brings us up to the nearest whole number. So if you'd have put in your answer on here, say 0.2, as you can see, it wouldn't have given you the mark, it's still at 0, 0 out of 6. Now in the exam, obviously it's not going to tell you that, this is the CBE platform. But notice how now I put in 20% and that is where we get the full mark. So note it down, follow the instructions, that's one of the areas where students will make mistakes. So next one on here, we've been asked for the return on sales. And look, there was just a nice little hint that that is also the equivalent of working out the operating profit margin. Now, if you don't know the operating profit margin going into this exam, you're going to be at a serious disadvantage because it's one of the easiest ratios to calculate. And you simply, all you do is just like the net profit margin, the gross profit margin, you take the operating profit divided by uh, the actual sales on there. So I'm going to look really silly now if I get this wrong. So I better get the right amount of zeros. Paying particular attention. And notice it says to one decimal place. So again, we have to multiply that by 100. And that gives us a finishing percentage of 1.4%. But it's to one decimal place, so hence 1.4. Now the general rule for one decimal place is that Say, for example, and in fact, well, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the answer so you can see it. So but there's our two out of two on there. If, for example, uh, we had an answer of 1.44, okay, and it asks us to one decimal place. Well, that, what that would mean is because it's four or below, that would mean the second decimal, we would round it down. So the final answer would be 1.4 to one decimal place. However, if the answer we got was 1.45, this is where anything five or above, so five, six, seven, eight, nine on there, then we round it up as a result, rounded to one decimal place. So hence the answer would be, to put in that box, would be 1.5. Because it was 1.45, we would have to round that second decimal place up, giving us a final answer of 1.5 on there. But in this case, it was 1.4, but it's just to be crystal clear so that you can cover all bases in your exam. Now, let me just cancel that, so then we don't get anything uh, else mixed up on there. Now, for the asset turnover, that again is looking at, in terms of what are we generating in terms of sales based on how much finance we've actually put into the business. So again, just work it through, nice and easy on there. And if you want to jot it down for how you interpret this, the higher 
the asset turnover figure, the better for the business. And I'll, I'll show you why now. So we take the sales figure, as you can see on the screen, and then we divide it by the 3,500. Oh my gosh, James, look at that. Terrible. Oh, nearly made the silly mistake. But that's the beauty of doing it on a computer and not on a proper calculator. But we're going to get it right for you guys on here. So there we go. 3,500. And that gives us 14.285714 and the rest of it on there. But notice how it's now saying to the nearest whole number. So exactly what we just talked about, we then have to go to the first decimal place. So it's 14.2. So the alarm bell should be ringing in your head saying, James, I know the answer to this. The answer is going to be 14 times. So we generate from the amount we've invested in the business, 14 times the amount in sales. That's if you want to get it written down to what it actually means. So hence, the more sales we can generate from the capital employed that we've put into the business, the better off we're going to be on there. Now, we have another calculation we need to do on here. So coming on to the actual residual income now, and this is where we need to actually consider uh, the input charge. So this is where from how much we've actually put into the business, there's likely going to be, and this is where you get the capital uh, employed as to, well, how much return are the equity holders going to want? How much uh, a return if we had it in, in loan forms would they want? And they've given us an input charge to have that 3,500 of 12%, which in essence means we have to reduce it from the operating profit. So all we simply do is take the 3,500, multiply it by 12%, and 12% of a decimal is going to be 0 0.12. And that gives us a figure of 420 on there. Now the residual income is basically the bottom line as to what we have made for the period. So what it's saying there is, We've got our operating profit less our input charge is going to give us our actual residual income. So the next line of the calculation is take the 700 on there minus the 420 and that is going to give us a figure on there of $280, $280 as the residual income for this period on there. Now coming on to the final one. Uh, we're asked about the market share and again to the nearest whole number. So again, think back to that question where we saw it in the final line that we know how many sales we've made for the period and how many the actual market's made. So again, let me just pull up what we've got on here. So take the 50,000 that we know are our sales and then you've got to be careful on the noughts now I'm going to be super careful after getting the last one a bit trickily wrong. Uh, 1.25, okay, so, and then three more. One, two, three, beautiful, right. Equals 0 0.04, so hence we multiply that by 100, and lo and behold, we get a, we have a 4% market share in terms of the number of sales. Whew. Six out of six, full workings, Notice how I'm trying to walk and talk it through to you to make it as easy to digest as possible. So now, this is where they love to do this in the exams. So they've got you going through calculations. Now they're asking you to really focus in and read the question properly with no figures. So what do we have on here? Is each of the following an advantage of residual income as a measure of divisional performance over the return on investment? So we've just seen it there. So before you even read anything, just define for yourself what residual income is. So that was the operating profit, less the charge, is basically the bottom line of what we've made for the period. And they're comparing that in terms of divisional performance to the return on investment. So how much we've pumped in, in terms of uh, investment, so it could be through equity in terms of shares or debt, and then how much have we made as a return on that? So either the bottom line of residual income or based on return on investment. So just have a little read on the screen and we'll go through them one by one because they've got to relate to those. 
So, as you can see on here, it says, it makes divisional managers aware of the cost of financing their divisions. We've also got, it helps in comparing performance of managers of divisions of different sizes. It ensures that managers will select projects with positive NPV. It is directly related to NPV on there. So we've got two NPV, net present values, and a couple of other statements. And the best bit of advice I can give you straight away is, just go for the one statement that you know, I know that one straight away. Okay, And the one I'm hoping that leaps out to you on there is about the final comment, that it is directly related to NPV. So we're looking for, remember, an advantage of residual income over return on investment. So residual income is all about saying, here's all the sales, less all of the costs on there, and gives us a bottom line profit. Well, that's the same as MPV, where it's directly related to, again, working out what the sales and positive cash flows are for the project, less all those variable costs, discounting those future cash flows to the present value, and it says if we've made money or not. So is it directly related to MPV? Yes, definitely on there. So then you have to say, right, let's go through them uh, one by one on there from the top on, uh, and we'll just see how we get on, really. Uh, so it makes divisional managers aware of the cost of their uh, divisions. So again, just like what we've talked about, residual income, take the sales, less those cost of sales, operating expenses, any other deductions, and that gives us how much we've made for that division on there. So wouldn't you agree that it would help a divisional manager be aware of the costing to finance that division based on the residual income over the simple return. We need the more detail on there. So I would be going with yes. Oh, thankfully it went to one. Good stuff. With yes on there. So the next one is it helps in comparing performance of managers of divisions of different sizes. Well, okay, that's a bit of a tricky one, but I'd have to reread that back. But let's go on to the next one. It ensures that managers will select projects with positive uh, net present values. Well, yes, it does in one sense, and it's the same with the sort of one the statement above. But we'll we'll go for the bottom one first of all. So it ensures that managers will select projects with positive uh, net present values. Well, the thing is, you can have two projects of two different sizes but could lead to the same NPV. There are so many other different factors that you need to take into account uh, and the scale and scope of the actual projects to ensure about selecting the right project and also think about the type of product. Um, could we have any synergies? The, the length of the project, there are so many other variables to take into account. Um, so it's not just simply selecting the positive NPV. So I would actually put no on that. Good. Um, next, it helps in comparing performance of managers of divisions of different sizes. Well, yes it does in terms of, right, you have a profit figure and then you've got a profit of one division over a profit of another. But it's sort of like comparing apples with oranges on there really because there are different circumstances for different divisions. It's far better to compare the same division year on year on year because then you've still got the same yardstick that's exactly the same versus, hey, there might be, again, depending on the type of product, it, the product may be perishable and they might have a bad season in the South Division, but the North Division did very well. So in terms of comparing, yes, it is one measurement, but it's not the overall one for it. Uh, and the different sizes and scalability doesn't make it fair as well. So I would put no on that. And those are my justifications for it. But can you see how I'm just trying to actually just walk and talk it through, keep it simple for myself on there, and then just go, right, What what is the logical sense based on what we're actually given? And then finally, for task three, uh, we have on here, which two of the following are non-financial indicators that can be used to measure performance. Okay, right, let's break it down again. Two of the following are non-financial that can be used to measure performance. So what you should be saying to yourself here is, if I see anything financial, okay, that is not correct on there. Okay, so 
that is what we should not be re not reselecting. So which two of the following are non-financial? So we've got to select the non-financial and click the, the box on there. If we see something financial, just leave it alone on there. That's the main thing. So first of all, the first one you see on there, profit per product per month. And you've got to be saying to yourself, well, profit is financial. I'm not going to touch it with a barge pole on there. Completely leave it. Return per machine per month, again, kind of gives a bit of a financial vibe on that. So I'm saying again, no, I'm not going to do that. Unless, unless there is another outspoken one below that you just go, well, that is definitely financial. But looking at this, defects per product per month, that's a non-financial indicator. And non-productive hours per month, again, that's a non-financial indicator. So the return is actually referring to uh, a monetary perspective, a financial perspective, uh, because we're looking at the actual potential costing behind it and, and also the output in terms of return, what we're getting out of it. So the two of the following that are non-financial indicators for me are definitely the defects, and then I'm hoping it's going to go to out of two. Marvellous. The non-productive hours per month. And that is how you go through a 10 marker ratio analysis, performance measurement and management on there. 10 out of 10. That will hopefully help you out with your examination. If you have enjoyed today's video, give it a massive like and thumbs up. As ever, thank you so much for watching. And I hope the video has been really, really helpful. Be sure to subscribe and hit the button below so you don't miss out on any future videos. Share this with any of your study buddies because it could be the difference to help them pass. And as ever, leave me a comment below what you thought of the video, any other requests like Sana, and also just let me know how you get on in the exam. Great to hear, and I love to hear the actual feedback of the videos. Hopefully it helps you see it in a different light from my perspective on there because at the end of the day, just getting a few of these extra little marks in the bank could be the difference in you getting that 50 plus and moving on to your next exam. But as ever, on that bombshell, we'll see you next time. Cheers.